Okay. Well, hello, everyone. I know we have some friends joining us today, uh, but for those of you who do not know me, I am Roberta Mancuso, and I have the privilege of being the associate publisher of New England Home Connecticut Magazine. I would like to welcome you to today's final session of three for our To the Trade Only Market Day event, The Life and Legacy of Mario Buada. I would first like to thank George Sneed and his team at Wakefield Design Center for our partnership. I would also like to recognize Beth Dempsey and her team from Images and Details for their role in helping us to bring nationally and internationally recognized design icons to our regional market. New England Home Connecticut and Wakefield Design Center have co-hosted this event for eight years, twice a year, at the beautiful, inspiring showroom of Wakefield Design Center located in Stamford, Connecticut, where we have a full afternoon of sessions, networking, great snacks, and we close out with wine and champagne. Obviously, we're not going to be doing that today. Adapting to our current environment with new technology, this spring, we spaced out our event into three sessions, and we hope you were able to catch the previous two as well. The videos of all of our events are up on our website under news and then select design dialogue, and that is the New England Home Magazine website. No great event can go off without sponsor support, and I would like to acknowledge our sponsoring companies for this spring. Heidi Haltzer and Design Decorative Work, The Linen Shop, Dean Distinctive Design and Cabinetry, L&M Cabinets and Rugs, I'm sorry, L&M Carpets and Rugs, Cabinets on the Brain, and Digital Home Systems. Typically, all of our sponsors have the opportunity to say a few words during our in-person events, but given our new format, we have given two sponsors the opportunity to speak at each event. Today, you will hear from our final sponsor, Tom Manna of Digital Home Systems. So I'm gonna turn this over to Tom right now. Thanks, Roberta. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this wonderful world of quarantine. I'm, I'm sure we're all becoming uh, very proficient at it. Um, technology. Um, we're finding out how important it is, unfortunately, through this, through this whole um, fiasco, for lack of a better term. Uh, our company and companies like ours, uh, we're, we're known in the industry as integrators, um, are, have been deemed essential. So we've been operating through, through this eight week period so far that we've been in this maybe more, I, I don't know, it feels like a year. Um, but we've been operating, unfortunately, we're not uh, doing much revenue in these, these days, but we are being asked by our clients to help them set up home offices, communications, get their networks right, help them with Zoom meetings, et cetera. So, um, the good news is for us, uh, technology has become essential in, in, the, in our world. And importantly to you guys out there, and, and by the way, Digital Home System is a company in Rybrook, New York. Um, so all, all of you in the area, come and visit our showroom, our experience center for all you out of the area. Just uh, take what you can and leave the rest anyway. From an essential standpoint, uh, we've been operating, and uh, the smart home concept really has become much more important with all of this. And a, what I like to tell you is what smart home isn't. Smart home isn't a Nest, isn't Sonos, isn't a Ring. Those are all devices. What smart home and technology, technology should do for you, the designer and our clientele base, is make life simpler, enhance life, and uh, just be an asset. So instead of picking up your phone, you know, demo this, and have one, in a, one of a million icons on your phone, that's not a smart home. You still have to hunt and peck to do that. And especially in today's age and for this, for this group, design is important. This is a smart home. This is sleek, this is easy. But to bring it into focus for what we've been doing the last few two months and how important we've become is this is a smart home. It's one very simple, easy panel or, pro, uh, or, or interface. And you can see here, if I lean this against my nose, uh, very simple icons, not a, bu not a bunch of, <laughs> not a bunch of uh, 
icons on your phone. And just to do this real quickly, if I go and press this button here, and I hit that button, client can see their whole household, no matter where they are, where they are from a distance, that quickly. And we can go back to the home. And if I wanted to check on my temperature in the home and wanted to set it, if I was quarantined away from my main house, maybe in the, in the country and I want to check on my city, city residents, here we have it. We can change at a glance almost. Uh, and if I want to turn the lights on or listen to music, it's that simple. So that's what smart home technology can do. That's what it has done for our clients in this time of uh, being locked up. And it also brings you entertainment at a, a touch of a finger. So we've been providing that, uh, communications, all the work stuff, and also the fun stuff, the games, the videos, the, the movies. So I'll leave you with this. Because of, the, because of this group, technology, I usually see eyes roll when I talk to architects and designers. They don't want to see anything. And I'll take a very different viewpoint from other people in my industry. Neither do we. We don't want to see one thing. And again, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with this. The earlier you get the integrators, in this case, the digital home system, into the process, the less you will see. You will not see, if you, if you make us an organic part of your project, you will not see technology and, you'll, and your clients will love their environment. So have a great discussion and I wish you all safe, safe healthiness and luck and hopefully we'll do this in person someday soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, that's Tom Manna from Digital Home Systems. Uh, before I turn this over to George Sneed, who is the owner of Wakefield Design Center, I would like to point out the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that for questions, which will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. George? Hey, Roberta. <clears throat> um, thank you. Um, you know, this is our, our eighth year um, of our partnership with New England Home. Um, I don't know, I personally almost like this format better than an actual live format. We can see each other closer, we can hear each other well. I, I don't know, I'm kind of excited about it. Um, so I would like to thank New England Home, Kathy and Roberta, um, also um, uh, Beth Dempsey, uh, Images and Details for, for, from our perspective of pulling all of this together and coordinating it, in addition to being the moderator on our segment today. Um, but before I introduce Emily Evans Erdman, I would like to say, um, for those of you who know me, number one, we're in Stamford, Connecticut. We're 12,000 square feet. We've been approved by the state of Connecticut to open under current guidelines. Uh, we would prefer you call and let us know you're coming just so we can have the appropriate area of the showroom set up. But uh, we have plenty of dist room for social distancing and uh, we have merchandise ready for instant delivery. Um, but anyway, uh, on, on a personal note, those of you who know me know that I'm not a very floral person. And you think of me as probably very clean and mid-century modern. I cut my teeth and got my start in the business working for Persnickety, which was a design-based firm out of Washington, D.C. In four words, they were known as um, uh, English country floral chintz. That's how we described it. It was back in the day when you know, English country and, and Mario Boata was our idol. And one of my really good friends came to the house and actually said, if you put one more flower in your apartment, I'm gonna to have to take hay fever medication. <laughs> so I hope that lets you know that I really do, I have an amazing appreciation uh, for, um, for, that, for that genre, that era, and I lived through it. So I am really, really, really excited. This is, um, as excited as I've been about a presentation, um, I mean, I've liked all of them, but I'm personally really looking forward to this. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Emily. Uh, Emily Evans Erdmans is a design historian and founder of Erdmans Fine Art, um, a fine and decorative arts gallery and consultancy in New York City. She's the author of several books, including monographs on Madeleine Castang, Henri Samuel, and is the co-author of Mario Boada. 50 Years of American Interior Decoration. Uh, a close friend of Boada, 
Edmonds has overseen the dispersal of his estate, including the recent blockbuster auction at Sotheby's. So I'd like to turn the meeting over now to Beth and Emily, and we're all really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, I'm as excited as Emily is today about uh, the discussion and everybody else. Um, so, Emily Edinger, can we have the slides? So, in just a second, we'll uh, start the uh, slide part. But first, Emily, I'd love, um, I'd love you to start and tell people, um, how did you meet Mario? I said, kind of sounds like a date, you know. Um, so tell me a little bit, you know, about your first encounter and how, uh, how you met him. Well, the, the very first encounter, which he would never have remembered, was I used to work for a dealer who exhibited at the Winter Antique Show, now known as the Winter Show. And as many of you probably remember, Mario was the chairman for many, many years and had sort of a reign of terror there. Uh, but I remember working the stand, opening night, and and this was the, the day people were still decked down in emeralds and taffeta for the opening night. It was so glamorous. And there was this man with a dollar bill on a string dragging it through the aisle. And, and you know, I, I hadn't really, I didn't really know much about Mario Buada at that time. This would have been, you know, in, in the, in the. It's in the 80s. Yeah. Around, well, around 2000 or something. Oh, oh, you met him at that point. Okay. <laughs> I moved to New York from uh, my graduate studies in London and took furniture very seriously, very academically. And then here's this crazy man, you know, with, and I, and I think even Martha Stewart was trying to pick up the dollar bill. So that was my first time um, encountering this famous Mario Buada. And then um, he wrote the foreword to the first book I ever wrote, which was for this gallery, Hyde Park Antiques. And, uh, and then we got to know each other a little bit uh, and then, Several years later, Rizzoli suggested me as the writer for this book, and I had, I've only written about dead people before, which after working with Mario, I think I'm going back to. Okay. Uh, dead people are much better as subjects. But, um, you know, when they asked me, it was such an honor and a privilege to oh, this course. living legend who had such a career and had never done a book to document it. And it was quite an experience being able to say, is this how it was? And he could say, no, that's totally wrong. Or yes, that's right. So it to work, you know, to be able to work with your subject was a fabulous, if frustrating experience at times. Well, it's always dual. Um, as, as I said, I think when we spoke before, um, on the current slide, you can just see a little bit of um, Mario and being a prankster. If you notice the rubber hand um, by um, his side, you can see the stack of, uh, of fabrics. That infamous rubber hand was something, um, one of the first things that I ever saw or knew of Mario. I uh, worked for a PR firm in the, eight, and that was actually in the 80s. Um, and he was our client at the time. And he would show up in the office back in the day with, um, it was Hebe Dorsey, Nancy Reagan, Alice Mason, and there would be Mario coming in with like the, you know, ex-president's wife, and there he would be with this big rubber hand on the desk, you know, and coming around to all of the girls, and that's just, you know, he was just such a personality, um, and as being one of the most sort of iconic designers of the 20th century, what do you, like, what do you really think was the appeal? Like, what was it? you know, about Mario besides the person. So let, let's, you know, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think if it's about the, his decorating style, which has its roots in um, the, the English country house style that John Fowler and Nancy Lancaster um, concocted or founded, I think he was about, um, he was about sort of joyous interiors. His one of his true geniuses was with color. And I have to think people looking through Architectural Digest and seeing one of his projects where there are watermelon walls or Robin's egg blue walls or chartreuse walls was a revelation. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think most people grow up with white or beige walls or 
you know, something kind of uh, neutral and to see that exuberance and, and exuberant is such a great word to describe him in every single way um, that from his personality and his joking to his version of the, the Colfax and Fowler style, he turned it up a notch and it was very romantic. I think that spoke to a lot of people. Um, there, there's, there's something um, like stage study, but in a very good way uh, about what he did. Uh, yeah, so I think those are two of the appeals, that it was joyous, romantic, um, you know, an antidote, it was sort of an antidepressant, um, right. if you will. You know, and during that time, you know, in so many, you know, his, the breadth of his career, it just, you know, it went on for many, many years. But I think, you know, today when you talk about branding and what sort of makes somebody unique, you know, he really became known as, you know, George started to say in the beginning, the Prince of Chintz. So, um and I, you know, sort of depending on the age of the people or participants here, you know, you look at it and being labeled as something can be really a good thing. And then other times it can't be. So let's talk a little bit about that whole sort of genre of becoming the Prince of Chintz and what, you know, when we, we have a, a slide up here at the moment that, you know, is a very, you know, Mario signature look. Yeah, well, I think um, from, in the words of Mama Rose, gotta have a gimmick, uh, just like Sally Jesse Raphael with her red glasses, which she hated, by the way. Mario really understood the power of repetition and for being known for something in particular. And so, for example, this is his living room we're looking at right now, which he moved into in 1976. And when we were working in his apartment after his death and organizing it, I mean, everything was right in that position. Um, and so that how many years, 40 years later, or well, over 40 years later. Um, and that is, I think, a, I wonder, I think this is a kind of decorating we're going to get back to or interior design we're going to get back to. Henri Samuel was very much like that too, that with your clients, you provide this foundation that you then layer on top of personal mementos and things that have meaning to you. And then, and, and it can just, it just gets richer and richer as opposed to, oh, I'm bored five years, let's gut it and do something completely different. Uh, I was just talking to um, an interior designer friend yesterday and she was talking about um, how being at home and spending so much time with all of her things is making her only want to be surrounded by the things she loves the most and that are the highest quality uh, and you know, and, and she wants to pare down and just, you know, it's sort of the Marie Kondo philosophy of everything sparking joy. And I, you know, this whole fast fashion moment we've been living in where, you know, it's like a very good, it's maybe $20, but, and it looks great right now, but then in, in six months, you're going to get bored of it. I don't think people are that interested in getting that little, I think there's a shift in that we don't want that quick, you know, we don't want to be trendy. Maybe we want to be more timeless and fashionable. No, I think I, I think that's true. I think that people are because of, as you say, the advent at the moment of people um, being in their homes are sort of reevaluating so many different things. Uh, and, and just looking, there's two two questions I have here, um, and just looking at this photo, um, one of which is all the dogs. What? Did he personally have a passion for dogs? <laughs> and, and two, I noticed that, you know, a signature thing that I've seen, you know, that Mario, and I wonder if he's one of the earlier ones, the um, photograph, the um, paintings over the bookcases, which I noticed you also have one in the background as well in your own apartment. Um, and that, you know, that sort of whole look and feeling. So the repetition, as you say, dogs, are those things like for him, were those collections where the, you know, was there something there, some story behind that? Well, he, and I think he stole it from Sister Parish. He would call his uh, rooms un the undecorated look or a collected interior. And so he very much saw um, his rooms as having collections on top of that. And, and which connects to the whole English country house style where um, generate, you know, hundreds of years of ancestors each bring their own things and then the next generation lives with it and adds something to their own. 
And if you think of how we are in America, you know, maybe we inherit a few things, uh, but, but most of the time when we buy a house or move into a place, we have to furnish it from scratch. And so one of his, uh, his point of view was let's make it, well, let's first go into your attic and try to reuse whatever we can reuse. And he was very thrifty actually that way. Uh, but then let's make it look as if, um, as if it's been added to over time. And so, for example, he would say, oh, don't do, don't cover all the chairs in the same fabric, do that chair in a different fabric so it looks like it's, it was put into a room a little bit later. So the dog paintings, if he had had a dog, it would have died in a week. He could not, he could not <laughs> have taken care of a dog. And so he, you know, he had a thing for, um, you can see these uh, these cavalier spaniels um, all the time, and it's sort of uh, it's it's sort of a twist on the ancestral portraits that you would see in an English country house. So he didn't inherit Van Dykes or Romneys, um, and in a way there's something very authentic about not putting fake ancestors on your wall, not going out and buying a whole bunch of dead people and putting them on. And so in a way, the dogs became, took the place of his, of the ancestral portraits. And some of these pictures are from the 18th century, most are from the 19th century. And if you look at the book, he famously said, he's, he's like, oh, these, these are my family portraits. And he, he even did a family tree with um, different pictures representing different people in his family. So there really was a connection between that whole idea of the ancestral portraits and the dogs. The one that's in the middle, right over the sofa, um, oh no, never mind. I, I, that's wrong. That's incorrect. It, it's a different picture I was thinking of. But the one, the, um, the upper right one is the very first dog painting he ever bought. And it's actually sort of ugly. But anyway, that's that's what kicked him off was that one right there. So I think everybody has finds that one thing, right? Mm. You know, something that starts you on becoming a collector, you know, and you know, obviously the term, you know, these days is minimalism, maximalism, and he definitely, you know, had maximalism, but I think it was through his own lens, as you were saying, right? You know, he really you know, you can tell that's the sign I look at of a really good designer and decorator is, you know, to be able to take such, you know, a, a amount, a magnitude of something in a particular area, and then how they juxtapose, and as you say, layer it, like you, and then you look at the blue and white collection, you know, um, you know, he definitely was collection upon collection upon collection. Um, he had poured a blank space. I mean, you could really tell that, that he just, everything had to be filled. And he just loved pattern on pattern and highly decorated surfaces. So if you look at what he was collecting, um, from pen work to Delft, you know, chinoiserie decorated pieces, you really see, like even the floor of this room is faux painted to look like sisal. So even the floor wasn't a solid color. Um, so he personally had a predilection for just, you know, just wanting to have a cacophony of, um, of things and patterns and colors. And he found that very comforting. And this was something that we were sort of talking about the other day that I also think this sort of Wada mania we're going through right now is a reflection of we, when we come, what do we want from our homes when we come home? Do we want the hotel style of sort of zen, sanctuary, calm, or do we want a cocoon that sort of stimulates us and is like a big duvet that we wrap ourselves around and call, you know, comforts us um, and engages us, which is more of what a Mario interior does. And I think, especially since we're not out in the world, um, pounding the pavement and exhausted when we come home, and we're, we're actually looking to stimulate and entertain ourselves at home that this, this shift back to a Mario or a more traditional style interior makes, makes sense to a lot of people or is more interesting to a lot of people right now. Yeah, I think it's very comforting. So I know in the next slide, um, I think is the infamous Nancy um, Lancaster, um, right? Yes. So but this is the say about this room. Um, so let's, let's, talk a little bit about why this yellow room became such a signature and has been like one of the most famous pictures that people always show when they show a Mario. 
Yes. And the, and the New York Times recently did a feature a few months ago about the most influential interiors of the 20th century. And, th and this was one of them. So it wasn't just for Mario. But when he first saw a photograph of this in a book in the early 1960s, it completely changed the trajectory of where he wanted to go. When he first came to, when he was first looking for his first interior design job, he wanted to work for Billy Baldwin. And Billy Baldwin is is a world away from from this room right here. Um, it's the color, it's it's glaze, it's the sort of rich egg yolk, but it was also the story behind the room. Nancy Lancaster uh, moved into what she called her bed sit or sort of studio bedroom. Um, in the 50s after she had divorced and she had lived in all these huge stately homes and brought all of these things from those those houses into this room and and he would call it uh he did call this room as he would call his own rooms a scrapbook of her life and he loved how you know she kept bringing things with her and if you go to the next slide um, this is Mario's apartment before the one that we were just looking at with the dog wall. And you can see that so many of the things in this room, including the curtains on the right-hand side of the screen, um, he, he brought with him for, through three or four apartments. And whatever he could reuse, he, he could and, and did and, and wanted to. So that everything is imbued with, um, with memory and nostalgia. And really, you know, he, he, Mario said to me, towards the end of his life when it, he just had too much stuff and I tried to get him to think about doing an auction before he died because I think he would have had a lot of fun with it and oh, he, said, absolutely. <laughs> he said Emily you have Andrew I have my things and so it really I don't know if that's a healthy attachment <laughs> probably not but for him these things had such meaning um they really did I think you know it's very interesting that you say that Emily because I think today that's um for a different generation, you know, to, to understand what the, you know, coming off of that sort of fast fashion mentality of really knowing that what it is to search and to find something and that there's a meaning and that there's a story behind it. So I would, I mean, wouldn't you say, I mean, he definitely was a romantic at heart, don't you think? Oh, he was. And I think, you know, his father was a band leader who had previously toured with Rudy Valley and his mother was very beautiful. And he grew up going to those, you know, 1930s, 40s movies. And, and I think he wanted life to be like that. You know, he wanted it to be a Fred and Ginger movie. And he said explicitly that when he designed a room for a client, he wanted it to be a backdrop for their life, but but in a in a glamorous one, a one that made them the ginger or the Fred and, and their own life. And so that's a very romantic point of view. And in his whole attitude um, of always wanting to joke and lighten up uh, the mood, which I think was one of the reasons he had such a wonderful relationship with his clients who often became very good friends and would work with him for decades, uh, was you know, don't take it too seriously. And if they got, you know, this, I'm sure a lot of designers who are listening right now know that it's, you're almost a psychologist working with clients and how it, it can sometimes get tense or a client can get too attached to an idea that you know is going to kill the design or, or something along those lines. And so how do you finesse it? And Mario just had such a light touch. Um, he really, you know, had a genius for that. Yeah, no, brilliant. I mean, you, you just look in, and some of the spaces are so incredibly timeless and, you know, there, there's just so many stories. And I, I think that when you go to, you know, as we look at the past, I think a lot of people are doing that right now as they're in their own homes is looking at the past to really, you know, plan for their future. And in, you know, the things about Mario also, I, I, I think is that you, you know, he grew up during war times numerous ones. So I think to the point of being able to look at those kinds of clients that he did over the time period and to be able to have that lighter touch or to be able to put together the sort of fantasy and story, um, you know, was something that was really comforting to the clients. And, and you know, they're long-term, as you say, that's what makes like a really good 
design and a designer and the client relationship you know, are those ones that continue. And I know for many people, he did numerous houses from them. And he went, as you said, would go through one as he went to the next house for them and take all of the things that he really thought were great as opposed to completely starting from over again. Yes. I mean, that was one of the wild things that I discovered, um, you know, when first working with him was how frugal he was and when um his the very he was working right up until his death and his last clients were the rosses who had just moved had just taken this apartment in river house and you know if you if you go into the book you can see their previous apartment and then the, the apartment before that which was in the sherry netherland and he only had for the lit for for those previous two apartments he only had to add like two chairs to the living room. Everything else could be reused. So when they sold their previous apartment, the buyer bought everything. And Mario, Mrs. Ross told me, she, Mario was furious that he had to go out and buy everything new for this apartment, which would be most designers dream, you know, like to, that you have to go shopping and go, you know, you can start from scratch and do something new. But he, you know, he really loved um, to reuse things. And he, he was very budget minded in his, in his way. Yeah. So he also had that saying of, about being right, you know, mm -hmm. and, and in a Mario kind of way. What, what exactly does that mean? I know from people who have encountered him and worked with him that, you know, that that was something that was important. He, I think people don't under, he, he didn't finish school. Um, he didn't finish college. He just did Parsons European summer school. He didn't, he didn't actually have a degree from a design school or even a certificate. But he had such an incredible understanding of architecture and proportion. I remember we were in, um, we were at this cocktail party of a very fancy socialite on Fifth Avenue. And he's in the corner and he's just tearing the room apart. And he's like, that lampshade is too small for that lamp. And like, he just couldn't help himself that he would, he would, everything would jump out at him that wasn't right. Um, and, you know, he, when he would come over to my apartment for dinner, you know, he just had, he, he just had it, you know, he just had this, um, this knack or this eye for knowing how, how a molding should be, how, how things should be scaled up and that kind of thing. So, that, I think that's what it is when it's, how do you know it's right? And you have to study architecture, classical architecture and the orders and all of that and proportion, but, but then it has to just, you have to internalize it so that you can go out into the wild and that just, you just know, and he, he knew, he just knew. Um, that, that, you know, I think people use the phrase today, that gut feeling that really, you know, he knows what's right and what isn't, and it just spoke to him instinctually. You know? Absolutely. And I don't think people understand how much of the architecture he would do in his projects, um, that he would move walls, he would, you know, add so many moldings and specify exactly, you know, how, you know, how high the molding should be or how thick and, um, and you have to get the bones right. I mean, I think any designer would say that you, if you don't get the, the bones right, you're, you know, you, you're just throwing money away. Um, so well, look at the bedroom. The bedroom, the mold, look at the molding alone on the, in, in this, uh, this bedroom, you know. Oh, yes. And I believe that is, um, it's a mirror. It's mirrored, actually, with um, either an overlay of fretwork molding or else it's faux painted, which is how he had it in his apartment. Um, I don't know if you can see there's sort of this fretwork detail on the, the large part of the, the frieze of the molding. Um, and so, yeah, that would have been mirror backed. And I think that was something Sister Parrish did too. But this is the room that, um, he, he was already very successful, but it was the room that um, Chauncey Howell, the news reporter for NBC, came and saw the, this 1984 Kip Space Show House. And when he saw this, he's like, Mario Buada, the Prince of Chintz. And of course, Mario had a, a suit of chintz made up, you know, the next day. So he understood the power of, of, of that moniker and ran with it, you know. Um, and, you know, you, I wouldn't necessarily think of this room as a super chintzy room because it is very, the palette is very um, restrained. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so he, he was very proud to have that. And, he he said to this in this one interview uh, magazine article that he really um, 
he really looked at ad, at advert what advertising companies would do and that you would saturate the market with one thing and so he he was purposely very heavy-handed with his look um so that people knew what his look was yeah. um yeah it was it was just you know multi-talented multi-faceted and i mean you even look in here so many little things like you know and you you can pull apart and get so many different design styles and things you know you look at upholstered beds like if you took the bed without the canopy and whatnot would have a completely different feeling you know that could somebody else could do in another house you know in five different layers like you can dissect the pieces so i'd love to sort of move fast forward a little bit um because i think that for people and to sort of understand the context of like not only the depth and breadth of what he was as a person and a designer but really what he did for the industry and so you know as we you just mentioned the sort of mario mania you know after he passed i mean not only were you a long learned long time friend and colleague and whatnot but you know you you had the monumental task of going through everything of his and i'm amazed that you're still alive to talk about it <laughs> me too <laughs> just the borderline, antibiotics <laughs> the borderline of anybody who has any understanding of who mario was and that like this is restrained to know the rest of the collections and everything else he had um and they as you said they were his things they were his children yeah um, and so to go through the estate you know tell us a little bit about your process of what you did, cataloged, organized it. And because he was the collector, like how, how did you decide, you know, and because you, you know, you were with him for such a long period of time, did you have discussions about things at a certain point? Well, it, um, you can, feel free. <laughs> yeah, he was really, I mean, he, it was really, he was a shopaholic or a collectaholic. He really, he probably bought something every day. And at the end, it was a little out of control. Um, and he just couldn't part with anything. We, so at the end, there was his apartment, there was his Connecticut house, which was really a storage place for him. And it was just heaving with stuff. Um, and then there were five storage units uh, and some, you know, you couldn't even open the, you could open the door two feet and then you have to wedge your body in because it was just so jam packed. As, as you know, he, he's somebody who has a, a great deal of meaning to me personally, but then also, as a, I, I see him as, as an important figure in um, design history. Uh, so everything that we would come across, and he didn't throw away anything. I mean, there were garbage bags full of taxi receipts from the 1960s. And I, you know, and I was like, should, should I throw these away? Because maybe there's some, maybe we can like recreate some trip he took or, so I was so afraid to throw away anything. And yet we desperately needed, there was so much to get through in a short period of time. So every, every day was exhausting because you had to make a thousand decisions. And I still, there are things that we, I'm not going to tell you what they are because it's too painful to talk about, but there are things that just the condition was not good enough and we let go of, and I still regret. Um, but we've, you know, we've put together an incredible archive of of, of his of his career from the '60s until the end of his days. We I found so many amazing things that we just weren't able to look at when we worked on the book together. So. Rizzoli um, and I are going to do a new book uh, coming out in 2022, which I'm excited about. Uh, and, you know, Mario never wanted to, like, it's interesting what you say, what he did for the industry. And he wasn't really a mentor like Albert Hadley. He didn't really promote, I mean, if you worked for him, you were in tears and then you quit in a few days. You know, he wasn't unlike Albert Hadley, who if a project was published, he would insist that the design, the junior or senior designer working on it had their name published in the article too. Um, but he did show up to everything. And I bet a lot of people who are listening right now remember him coming to their showroom, um, sitting with them. And that was sort of how he supported the industry. He, he went to everything. And I thought he went to too many things at the end of it. But um, 
you know, that's, he really loved, he, he loved everybody in the industry. He was really very much a people person, you know, he was definitely a people person and it was the connections. Um, and that's uh, to your point. I mean, everybody does it their own way. And so I think that, you know, in my encounters with him over the years, you know, he definitely, you know, was able to support people, but it had to be on his terms and his way by all means. Um, but I think he was definitely very encouraging to people. Um, but yeah, it, so many yeah. stories of the, the very first day somebody opens up a shop, he's there. He's the first person at the door. So that, you know, that's really wonderful to have Mario Guada show up, you know, your very first day. That makes you feel like, okay, I'm doing something right here. So that was, so he was very supportive in that way. Um, and I, you know, when I did, I had this book signing party for Henri Samuel at Christie's and Mario was not doing very well. He was living at an um, assisted living facility at that time. And he dragged himself down for it, you know, and he, and you could tell that he was not feeling very well. And he was just sort of huddled in a corner with his walker. But friends told me how they would go up and talk to him and he would whip out one of his toupees and make a joke. And you could tell that he just like, he lived for that. Like he loved that and he wanted to be there. And it meant so much to me that he, you know, that he would make that huge effort. Um, no, that's, it's like, he's a true and a loyal friend. He was also, as you said, you know, he was a comedian at heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes. You know, so a little bit, I, um, because of the, let's just talk a little bit more about the auction because I think people were just like fascinated. Like, did you have, you know, any idea that it would have gone the way that it did? Um, well, I thought it should have gone better. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, I'm never happy. I'm like Mario. Okay. So the first one was two days, and I think how much was like seven point six million. I read. Yes. Pieces yeah. were in it. There was well, like it was um, you know in in the negotiating of which auction house we were going to go with. I had a very clear vision from the first and one of the number one goals I had was that at least a thousand pieces were taken because the collection was so massive, but also to communicate his, um, just sort of how, what a maximalist he was, what, how voracious he was, that we needed to show that, you know, we couldn't just cherry pick down to a couple hundred lots. We had to show this, like this, you know, I mean, if you look at his book, it's like 5,000 pages and, you know, you get a hernia from carrying it. You know, he was all about more is more is more. And so I knew the sale had to be that way. And I had a very clear image that um, it needed to be, we needed to recreate his, his apartment as much as we could. And uh, Sotheby's was just terrific. And um, they brought in uh, Rush Jenkins, who's an incredible exhibition designer who did the bunny melon um exhibition as well so the they they were terrific to work with um but i think i mean it was it was a very intense experience uh, but it, you know and, and everybody at sotheby said probably you know one of the the biggest most interesting eccentric sales they've ever worked on in their career but i couldn't believe the reaction it got you know i you know when if, if anybody visited the exhibition, you'll remember that was that huge mural um, with the cutout figure of Mario. And from the beginning, I had a vision of, of that being a place where people could come and take their pictures and have an Instagram moment. Uh, and so, you know, in this, this is one of the first Instagram era sales. And, but it just took off in a way that I never would have thought. And Sotheby's kept saying they couldn't believe how many young people were walking through um, the, the rooms. You know, they, not everybody is 40 and up. Um, so that, that was really cool. And I think I, I have theories about that one. And I'm curious to hear what everybody listening has to say about it. But I think as we're in this Instagram era and we're very much, we're all presenting ourselves on our Instagram page, we're all becoming personal brands. We're aware that the environment that surrounds us is, is an extension of our personality. And so a hotel room kind of style doesn't really communicate anything, but to have something like Mario, what Mario did, which is so personal and idiosyncratic, um, I think a new, you know, I think this younger generation likes that um, and is embracing that. 
No, it's, I, I think it's definitely, there was a multi layers to the sale. Um, and the kind of people were there, were people buying entire collections of things? Did you find it was that the, you know, the kinds of people, do you have any idea? Um, did Sotheby's share anything with you with like, you know, were people buying entire lots? Um, well, they didn't share, no, they, they are not allowed to share that information, but some people would communicate, have communicated with me directly. Um, and so, yeah, there were a few people, I mean, the dog pictures have all, you know, like the wall of dog paintings has all gone all over the world. Um, and yeah, no, so yeah, I think, but I, I would say most people didn't just buy one thing from the auction. If they were bidding, they, they got a few things. Um, but yeah, it was. So Mario, do you think that's what it was? What, what do you think that like really, you know, propelled a piece of history, a piece of his personality, the designs? Do you think that's what people wanted? I think, I think the name for sure, but I will also say that everything he chose had a little something special about it. Um, it, it just had a little twist to it, or it was a little prettier than usual. And so there was, there was something about his eye that was, you know, he really did have a terrific eye. And, and so I think, I think it's compounded by buying a piece of design history and it was an epic sale. You know, I think it's something the catalogs are going to be collected. And so to have something from that moment yep. means something to people. But I think the objects themselves, um, like who, I think it was Richard Michon on his Instagram, he finally unpacked. Um, these li like this little Delft uh, butter holder that he bought, and he's like, "Oh, it's so much prettier than I remembered." You know, I'm enjoying it so much more than I realized. And I, I think when people bring these things home into their own, you know, and, and it's just one piece of Mario instead of a thousand pieces, like at Sotheby's, they're going to be surprised and so happy at how pretty it really is on its own. Yeah. No. I, to your point, the Instagram thing. I think I just saw the other day the Madcap Cottage Boys, Jason and John, just got pieces and like, they're like kids in a candy store opening up the Mario pieces and showing the video of all of them. So I think to your point, I think that there is gonna be, you know, this return of pieces having meaning really behind them and wow. your home. Um, so before we open up, we have some questions here. Do you have a favorite Mario memento? Oh my God, I, I maybe have a few. Um, one that has so much meaning to me is this picture of, of Mario that was drawn by Constantine Kakanius, a Mario in his bed. And, it, um, and Constantine did it for the New York Times for the story on beds. It was, I think it was, was it, I think it was the last lot in the Sotheby's sale. I wasn't allowed to bid at Sotheby's because I was so involved, but somebody, um, this wonderful woman, Luzanne Adi, bought, knew that I liked it and she bought it and gave it to me as a gift. And I have it hanging on uh, the other, the matching bookcase that you can't see behind me. Um, so I look at it every single day and Mario loved that bed and lived in that bed. That was kind of his own, his personal, like his main space in his apartment that he lived. And he, it's just, it, it shows him, I, I wish I had a slide of it, just shows him surrounded by fabric samples and books and just and a cocoon within the cocoon. And um, so I, I just, it's so, I treasure it so much. Yeah, you're so lucky, you know? The idea that you, you know, got to be able to spend so much time with him and really understand him. Um, is there anything that you really would like else to say that you want people to know about him that they may not or that you'd like to share before we open it up for questions? I think the most, what I hope everybody takes away with them is, 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 to, is, is the joy that he tried to create with his work. Um, you know, he, he wanted he wanted people to be happy. Um, he wanted people to feel glamorous. And I think that's been, that's been sort of out of fashion for a while, but to me, that sounds pretty, pretty damn good. Um, and I, I would say that's, that's something we, you know, I hope people embrace. And, and another, one other thing is, you know, he always tried to make us laugh and, 
it, it, this, this time right now would have been so tough for him because he was such a people person, but he would have been on the phone 10 hours out of the day, calling all his girlfriends, gossiping, joking. And that's a less, I'm naturally a reclusive person. So I find it hard to, I don't pick up the phone as often as I should, but that's a big lesson he taught me about friendship is reaching out to people and picking up the phone. So hopefully all of you will pick up the phone today and just call in and have a gossip with somebody um, and, and think about him. So, okay, so we have some questions. You ready to let's see? Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got questions and I've got some chat comments. Um, and let's see. Um, great job, Emily team. Um, any chance there will be a future retrospective of Mario that could be mounted? The auction certainly was a nod to this. I'm thinking sort of a Dorothy Draper-esque at the museum at the city of New York or elsewhere. Well, my hope is that the these enormous archives that we've compiled make their way to an institution, um, possibly the New York School of Interior Design, where they have um, a materials atelier named after him. And it would be wonderful to, to sort of um, celebrate that, that moment of the archives going there with an exhibition. So I do hope, I definitely hope that that happens. Okay. Let's see what else I have here. Um, Oh, somebody wanted to know what the saying is on the Green Needlepoint pillow. Where? I don't, you know what, it just came in. So it's probably on one of the earlier slides, which we can, um, Emily and I can, I can go back through. So once we find that slide, I'll let you know whoever our steamer is that sent us, we can answer that. We'll okay. answer back. Um, so the, another question is, what do you think the future of antiques are? Are they gonna make a comeback as they should? Well, I will say, if you look at his collection, he didn't have a lot of brown wood. Almost everything was painted. And I do think um, like the brown wood of antiques is not, we're not going to see, so I don't think we're going to see so much of that, but I do think, um, I, I do think we're going to see um, people, I think people are feeling more comfortable buying at auction. Hopefully they're, they'll, they will go to dealers as well. Um, but yeah, I think the, the whole idea that we don't want um, something cookie cutter that you're going to see in everybody else's apartment, where else are you going to find that, but with antiques really. So yeah, I do, I do think antiques are, are going to come back. And, and right now is an amazing time to buy and often they're much less expensive than um, a new reproduction piece. And they have a lot more resale value too, so it's a better investment. Okay, I think, um, I'm trying to think, I'm going through, I'm looking to see on these. Sorry, it just takes a second to read them. Um, we've answered a lot of them. Um, let us wear. What was his, what, tell me, me personally, I'm like, what is it that- I know, you're obsessed with that. Well, I, you know, he, for him, every room, he wanted to turn every room into an indoor garden. So the colors that he would use were all sort of the, the clear colors of flowers and foliage. And, and so if you look at the porcelain collection he had, a lot of it was either decorated with botanical, uh, specimens or in the form of cabbages or tulips. Mm -hmm. So the lettuce wear is, is, um, you know, just an extension of that. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, so this was great, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, we really thoroughly enjoyed having you today, um, to share the life and legacy of Mario Buwata. And I hope everybody takes a little bit more comfort in their homes today um, as they're spending more time at home and realize it's okay to have things around you and they can be your friends. Um, and, you know, at some point you just need to, need to learn to know when to stop. I think that's probably. <laughs> that's right? a good point. Yeah, there, there is a stopping point at some point. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, and everybody who's been part of our journey in this virtual to the trade day, um, thanks for tuning in. We will keep you posted of other events and activities that we have going on. So um, be safe, um, go out there, shop, support your people and keep designing guys. So thank you. Thank you guys.
everyone just want to say thank you for joining us from new england home and um i think maybe george is going to pop up in a second there he is hi <laughs> um wow that was fascinating um and and to beth's point you know um back in the day in the 80s i had someone who said often that it was impossible to over decorate i think we might have found the exception to that rule <laughs> but it, it it was it was as expected just breathtaking what a what an experience you must have had um pulling that together and and i just would like to thank everyone who's um joined us for all three who just tuned in today and as roberta said they are all available on the new england home archive thank you so much can't wait to see you in the showroom and we're looking forward to expanding uh, our new format. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye guys.